Hey, aloha, Bulavinaka to our friends and family that are listening in uh, tonight. Uh, happy International Women's Day uh, 2024 uh, from our sisters and mothers and daughters and grandmothers um, and granddaughters here from the United States. Uh, so today is the uh, 8th of uh, March, 2024. And uh, I'm so blessed to uh, have one of our sisters uh, from uh, Temwana Nuya Kiwa uh, from the Pacific, uh, who is joining me today for a short Talanoa, uh, short uh, talk story, uh, to be able just to share a little bit about the work that we do in the field of museums. Um, and so before we um, start our Talanoa, uh, as usual, for those of you who often uh, uh, join me in my uh, podcast, uh, we often uh, play a song um, just to give time for our dear friends who are finding their way um, to join us today. So since our guest today is from the beautiful islands of Hawaii, um, we would like to play a song. Uh, from Hawaii. And I know many of you have been seeing some of my posts um, when uh, um, there was a movement uh, by the indigenous Hawaiians against the um, the 30 meter telescope that was going to be built uh, up on Mauna Kea, uh, on one of the largest mountains in the world. Yeah? And um, through that movement, there was this song um, that was created by amazing Hawaiian singers. And uh, I would like to play this song to open up our Talano today. Aloha kako ni sambule binaka. Oh, oh, come on, Kailana, ne Hawaii, now we're a halulu, kaho noa, haumea, na kulu kulu, e kalani, ki e ki e, kaumailuna, awe ke aloha ole, akamali hini. Meko kamala la valula, meka kuhi heva. Alu mai pu, alu mai meko mano kalani po. Kai mai ana mena kama kailani. Kuha ahe.
Powerful song. Uh, there is uh, no called Ku Haaheo e Ku Hawaii. Yeah, what a beautiful song that uh, resonated really well. Uh, and I was so blessed to uh, be on Hawaii uh, and uh, you know seeing the movement by our indigenous uh, brothers and sisters from Hawaii uh, going over to Mauna Kea every day for months. Um, you know, fighting against the system that was, you know, pushing through to get the 30 meter telescope. They are built uh, on the uh, beautiful mountain uh, of Mauna Kea. So for those of you who are listening in and haven't been to Mauna Kea, if you get a chance to go to Hawaii, make sure you go to the big island and um, you are able to go up and visit right up to the top of the 30 meter of um, the Mauna Kea where the 30 meter telescope was supposedly you know to be built on eh? so we have our uh, dear sister from Hawaii uh, joining in now uh, Angela Nella aloha and bulavina aloha good how are you today you Angela <laughs> Very good. Yeah, thank you for um agreeing to join me today uh for a uh, you know short talk story um uh, to celebrate the International Women's Day and also just to um you know share a little bit about the work and the passion uh we both have for uh, museums. Um so for the benefit of our listeners, would you like just to share a little bit about your um Ohana? Uh, and uh, your connection to Hawaii, uh, where your your parents come from, and also where you were raised in Hawaii, Angela. Okay, um, so I'm I'm uh, I was actually born in Idaho, but my grandmother grew up in Paoa on the island of Oahu, and and uh, I do genealogy research. It's just part of um, I think my interests in history and understanding, you know, where my family comes from. And, and so I know I've got five generations that have grown up in Paola, you know, back to the mid 1800s. And, and as you know, with Hawaiian genealogy, sometimes it's a little harder to get back further than that. Um, but when I was, uh, my grandmother actually met my grandfather on Oahu um, during World War II. He was on Oahu working, um, with a company that was working for the military and um when my dad was probably about four or five I think they moved to Idaho and so he he grew up mostly in Idaho and that's where I was born and we moved back to Hawaii where he went to grad school at University of Hawaii at Manoa mm -hmm. um so when I was living on Oahu we um lived in Pololo Valley so next next door and um lived there until my dad finished his PhD. He's a geneticist. He had a PhD in genetics. And uh, then we moved to Illinois where I pretty much spent most of my middle school and high school years. So, That's amazing. But, yeah, we have a, I have a sister and I'm married, have two children. I have a new grandbaby on the way. So Yay. That's good. So yeah. you're gonna join the, the, is it the grandmother club or grandparents Apparently. club? <laughs> Oh, wow. So in terms of, you know, your, your work in museums, you know, I've been really, um, you know, interested to find out like what um, triggered your interest to get into the field of museums. Uh, and yeah. You know, I think I kind of fell into it. I mean, I was really, I remember being like four years old and watching TV in Hawaii and there was a commercial or something for um, Honau Now. Um, now, now, and I remember watching that and thinking, I want to learn about that place. And so for as long as I can remember, I've always wanted to be an archaeologist and really thinking that archaeology was sort of the way that you learn about the past and, and how people used to live in the past. Right. And so when I ended up in college, um, you know, I think as you know, people, you know, anthropology is not exactly the financially the greatest field to be in. 
and I had taken a couple of um, other, you know, different routes thinking that I really shouldn't go into that field, but realized that that was really where my heart was and ended up um, finishing my bachelor's degree in anthropology and got a job working um, for an archaeology at the University of Illinois, they were doing archaeology for the Department of Transportation. And so kind of started doing archaeology there. And then there was a job opening at Bishop Museum. And um, I always, you know, when we left Hawaii, I never wanted to leave and I always wanted to go back. So I, I applied for the job and they had um, written and said, basically, um, you know, we, we need people who work in a lab archaeology lab and you have that experience will you know will you come and work in the lab and I, where I worked at Illinois my boss there was like you know if you've never had an archaeology field school I would never hire you to be in the field so I kind of felt like I better take the job because otherwise they might say you don't have a field school we're not going to put you in the field and it turned out I, w I went there and I really like lab work I really like um, working with material culture and and taking care of things and being organized and logical. I mean, that's sort of how I am. Um, I had the opportunity to go into the field. I would say that it's not my favorite place to be. I mean, it's fine, but I'm definitely not a field archeologist. I'm much more a collections person. And so I worked at Bishop Museum and, um, you know, ultimately became the lab director overseeing the processing of collections that were coming in from, from different uh, contract archaeology projects that were going on, and and I ended up um, actually being in charge of the H three collections, so all of the H three collections that were coming through, um, and ended up becoming the archaeology collections manager at Bishop Museum, so overseeing all of the archaeology collections that were within the department, so not just the contract archaeology, but also that had been at that museum for you know quite a while. Um, so I'm I'm an archaeology collections person. That's really kind of where my expertise lies. Wow, that's amazing. And how long uh, did you uh, work at the Bishop Museum? You know, it wasn't very long in the in the um, it, you know, it turned out to be four years, which wasn't very long. It was it was a really hard decision to leave. Uh, Nagpur had just passed, but I also felt like it was time to go to grad school. A lot of people, you know, who were moving up had graduate degrees and, and I sort of felt kind of stuck and felt like if I wanted to do more, I really needed to have a graduate degree. And so I ended up going back to grad school. Mm -hmm. um, wow. You know. So is that a decision you were happy that you, you know, you made? I think so. I think so. I might've, you know, maybe what I don't know I, it was fine I mean I my belief is you're put where you're supposed to be and uh so Absolutely. you know I had a couple of schools that accepted me that sometimes I think oh what if I had gone there and and but you know mm. you are put where you're supposed to be and Absolutely. It's all about timing too. Eh? Sometimes mm -hmm. it's meant to be for you to be in a certain place. Eh? And speaking of archaeology, you know, a lot of people, um, you know, like in my case as well, eh? my field background is in archaeology. And uh, when I was in Fiji, um, you know, when people, um, you know, interview me and ask me questions, most of them know that it's a very male dominated field. Mm -hmm. And it is true. And since, you know, we are uh, celebrating International Women's Day and, uh, you know, we're celebrating uh, women's achievement. How have you seen women's role uh, and, you know, contributing to the work in museums today when you look back to when you first started, wow. Angela? Wow. Hard question. <laughs> you know, I think, I think when you, at least in archaeology um, anyway, um, a lot of the people working in the lab working mm. with the collections were women um yeah. you know i think it was harder probably for women to be be field you know mm. to be in the field and be sort of project directors so i think that's changed a lot there are a lot of women in archaeology now um and uh still doing a lot of collections work but but really a lot of of women in different roles you know and and, and uh, owning owning cultural mm -hmm. resource management programs, um, you know, built businesses and 
and um i think it's i think it's grown i think um i think a lot of women have have um you know braved a lot of things you know i i didn't I think I'm in a generation that maybe didn't have as much of the, of of um, the hardship that set, that women who were in archaeology before me had, mm -hmm. um, and I and I feel like maybe sometimes women today, the the young ones coming up, don't really realize, sort of the hardship that people had, um, in the past, um, so kind of a different world today. Absolutely. Yes, so things have changed, I'm sure, from, you know, back in the day when, uh, you know, those kind of fields yeah, are more, you know, mainly for, for, for our male counterpart. Uh, but it's just wonderful, you know, to see a lot of even the students that you're teaching, you know, when I see the pictures you post up, you know, it makes me smile to see a lot of our women, you know, joining this, uh, these museum classes uh, that, that you are teaching. So um, would you like just to share with us what where you are logging in from? And oh, uh, sure. you know which and which institution you are you are working for. Okay, so I when I left Hawaii, went back to grad school at the University of Illinois, and I was there for probably about eight eight years. Went to go to grad school and ended up um, getting a research associate position where I used to work before. Um, and because of my experience at Bishop Museum, they actually asked me to be the curator for the archaeology program there which I love because that's really what I do. And so I, I was there for a, a while working. And then I had the opportunity to meet with um, a Wanapum elder who they were looking for a person who had a background in archaeology collections. Mm -hmm. And um, so we met and talked and he, he was, he really had a, um, when he spoke, he, the way he felt about the importance of collections to his um his you know his indian group his tribe um was really how i felt about hawaiian collections for me and my identity as a hawaiian person and mm -hmm. so i i kind of realized that i was really interested in the job and so i'm i'm living here now in ellensburg washington i've been here for 22 years um, coming up on 23 and i uh, work as curator for the wanapum heritage center which is a kind of a it's a tribal museum but it's um it's a, a museum for a non-federally recognized tribe who has a relationship with a public utility that, that operates two dams on the columbia river and so that is amazing and in terms yeah. of the indigenous communities there um that's the uh, called the wanapum tribe mm -hmm. Wow. And in the museum or is it a museum or is it a cultural center, Angela? I guess we call it the Heritage Center. Heritage Center. So we have a, you know, we have a repository, uh, permanent exhibit, temporary exhibit, language programs, living culture programs. Um, so different, different things. That is amazing. And how many people uh, work there in total? Do you have a rough number? Uh, we're about maybe 25. Hmm. And how many of them would be um, uh, women? Oh, women? <laughs> Let's Is see. it like a 50-50 or 60-40? Uh, maybe more 60-40. Hmm. Then we have more women than men. And a lot of uh, one of them work there so okay and for our listeners you know who are uh, logging in today you know most of them they uh you know often wonder you know who what is a, a curator because a lot of times you know those of us who work in the field we say this uh terminologies you know uh, because we are familiar with it so as, in terms of a curator would you like just to explain in simple terms um what does that term mean yeah, I think for me, so I think it really depends on where you're working in the museum you're working in. Um, but for for because we're a small museum, um, really, I'm I'm a collections manager. I'm a curator. I'm a registrar. You know, I sort of do all of that collections based kind of work and then help support, um, you know, exhibits and things when when that needs to be done. So really managing the collections and I uh, manage ethnographic and archaeological 
and archival collections too. So I've sort of expanded my my work um, out of archaeology and into some other um, collection types that I didn't really have that experience in before. Wow. So when you say archival, would you be referring more to paper materials, mm -hmm. records? Yeah, photographs, documents, library material, uh, oral history. So we have a lot of uh, analog audio visual visual. Wow. So many of these uh, audiovisual would be of the people of the Wanapum tribe that were recorded? Um, we have some of that. We also have people that uh, know the Wanapum. So we also record non-Wanapum, but who, who have um, uh, relationships with, with the Wanapum. Oh, wow. So in terms of photographs, how far back do you think uh, the collections would take you to? Um. Maybe the from the First World War time or before? I'm thinking maybe about turn of the century, 1900s. Okay. Yeah, and yeah. in terms of... Um, I have a couple of photos that are earlier in the 1800s, 1800s. but it's very, very rare. Wow. That's amazing. So yeah. in terms of the Heritage Center, um, how do the local community uh, view the center and how do your staff connect with them? Um, I think there's a lot of relationships there with between the community and the Wanapum Heritage Center. Um, just because it's such a, you know, it's a rural community. And so um, we have a lot of, um, our, our facility is open to use by the community. So I think we end up, um, people learn about the Heritage Center and want to come and visit and and see it and and sometimes people are be driving down the road and they'll see it and they'll stop and not realize it's there and so um it's it's a really uh, great place mm. so for those of our uh, listeners who are connecting in from washington uh state so bolivinaka to our dear friends uh, who are connecting in from uh, the united states especially on the on the west coast so if they want to come over to your uh, heritage center how is it uh, in terms of distance to, uh, is it Seattle and Portland? Yeah, uh, so we're about three hours east of Seattle. Okay. So, wow. yeah. Wow, three, three hours, hours, yeah? So, yeah. yeah, we know that there are some Fijians as well as Islanders as well that are mm -hmm. in that area, yeah? Yeah, on the west side of oh. Seattle. Yeah, the Seattle side, right? Wow. That's amazing. Yeah, so I think in our conversation today with Angela, for those of you who are logging in, you know, really just highlighting the important work um, that, uh, you know, curators such as Angela play in these heritage centers. Uh, in some other places, you know, they call museums, some other places they call cultural centers. Uh, in many of these institutions, as what she said, uh, they also have uh, archival collections. So you are welcome to go to museums near you, where you live. Yeah. So many of these museums, um, they love to welcome you. So Angela, do a lot of people uh, just pop in, as you said, you know, a lot of walk-ins uh, from those who are in the neighborhood who just want to come in and be interested in what you do? Um, I don't say we'd get a lot of pop-ins for the collections, we get just more pop-ins for the exhibits. Exhibits. Um, yeah, and the collections, you know, the Wanapum are, are um, oversee who can have access to the collections. So requests need to be made in advance for that. So there is an exhibition team then in the Heritage Center? Uh, yep. Wow. We're, we're sort of a small staff, lots to do, so. Yeah, no, that's amazing. So for those of you who are watching, we'll um you know it we'll put up the website as well uh on online so you guys can also see you know what the um the one upon heritage center uh do. Eh? Um so they have exhibitions, they also have collections, and they also have um collections for archival materials, yeah, photographs and audiovisuals and all of that. Now for those of you who may not know, uh, Angela, as you mentioned earlier too, you mentioned NEPRA. Um, so maybe I will say the name, the full name. So NEPRA is the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. 
Um, so I also know that our work uh, or even your work mostly for you in particular involves a lot of the um, the work under the NAGPRA Act here in the US. Um, how did your work start uh, here in the US under this uh, NAGPRA Act, uh, Angela? Yeah, so I, I think, you know, NAGPRA was passed when I was in Hawaii working and I think um, a lot of people just weren't really sure what was what that was going to be. Um, and and so, you know, just being in the in the lab there, we had to start, I think, identifying, I don't, you know, things that fell under the law. So we're, we're looking at human remains, funerary objects, sacred objects and objects of cultural patrimony. And from the archaeology side at Bishop Museum, it was it was kind of understanding the collections and if if we had any any material that came from, you know, mm. what that met those definitions in the law and working through that. Um, I think when I was um, at Illinois, we, um, the department had of anthropology had done their preliminary reporting that was required under the law. Mm. And, and I oversaw a repatriation request from the Sock and Fox, um, but didn't really do a whole lot um with NAGPRA there at the university mm -hmm. with you know with the exception of seeing that um overseeing that and then um I did have a project at University of Hawaii Hilo where I um began a, a, the a NAGPRA compliance work for them to get them started so really kind of getting a handle on what the collections were there that needed to be reported on and and getting that started um so that's kind of what I've been doing I've been working on um, with the plateau tribes, um, helping provide technical support in that perspective. But, um, yeah, I yeah. don't want to talk too much about that. Yeah, it's, it's just amazing, you know, that we can be able to, you know, help communities, uh, particularly, you know, those of us uh, who are listening, you know, when, uh, when it comes to museums, <clears throat> most of the time they are, uh, you know, they often just come in bringing visitors for the front of house. Um, mm -hmm. And very few people kind of, you know, uh, connect to see uh, what is actually behind the scene. Um, and so, you know, our talk story today really highlights to those of our listeners um, to see that we have curators, uh, we have archaeologists, you know, we have exhibition managers, and uh, there are so many roles uh, in the museum that uh, if the parents who are listening in, you know, your children, if they're really good in designing, uh, even uh, young children today, you know, they're really good in social media. I've been mm -hmm. um, looking at some roles of museums that just employ, you know, individuals who are just, you know, that's their job every day to put it, put whatever they're doing on social media. Isn't that interesting, Angel? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We were just yeah. talking about that in a meeting today about um, the, uh, looking to start a new association of archaeological collection repositories and and talking about social media needing to be in the bylaws about that's one of the ways that we disseminate information about, about the archaeology collections. Absolutely. So. Yeah. And I've also noticed, you know, things have changed uh, over the years. Yeah, I remember when I was uh, uh, teaching at the University of Auckland, I used to take uh, my students over to the Auckland Museum. And when we arrive at the museum, you know, they give us the uh, the rules or, and guidelines of what to do and what not to do. It's lots of what not to do. Yeah, which you and I will agree with, right. you know, there's lots of things, you know, don't touch this, you know, we have to put our bags in a certain area. You cannot take water, food, you know, all of those things into the collections room. Um, and also photography, I remember very well, was not allowed. So everyone had to leave their phones in their bags. Um, but now there's a whole shift, you know, um, mm -hmm. now that I remember when I was doing the um, Pacific Collection Access Project uh, in July with the, uh, the Auckland Museum, they were welcoming it. You know, I remember I came with my camera and there's a few others who were with us that day and we had to ask permission. I asked the people at the uh, Auckland Museum, are we allowed to take photos and are we allowed to share this, especially they were Fijian artifacts. And uh, mm -hmm. they were like, share it, you know, share it so that we can, you know, get a lot of Fijians to um, talk story to that uh, treasure, the Taonga, and the information. And it was amazing, Angela. 
you know, Fijians yeah. from England, Fijians from Germany. And the beautiful thing about it, a lot of them were sharing their memories. You know, when they saw a basket, they remembered their grandmother. Mm -hmm. You know, and they were and they was and they were telling stories all online, you know, and it was just so beautiful to you know to see that. So now what do you think about your work now that you've just mentioned that social media needs to work with us in the museum so we can share to the very people that we want to reach? I think, I mean, I think what's really good about, I mean, one, I think it's good because it's a way to reach those folks that may not be able to come and they can see what's there. But I think it helps help sort of non-Indigenous people understand how important the connection to those things are for Indigenous people. And so it, you know, it really, you know, people talk a lot about the intangible cultural heritage, um, but that intangible cultural heritage are those stories and songs and memories and 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 you can't you know a lot of that doesn't always come out unless you're having that relationship with those objects right and you're being able to um share with people and have that connection and and i you know i think there's been a there's really is a shift in museums right now of of bringing more and you know it's it's slowly happening probably for the last 10 to 15 years with different projects like this um, school for, for for advanced research and their building uh, museums and communities work um you know or you look at the society for american archivists and their protocols for um native american materials and and including um indigenous voice in that um, and so there's slowly had these projects that have come forward, but now you look at the American Alliance of Museums and they really are now pushing that, um, I can't think of the name of it right now, but the, the um, um, it's totally, I should be prepared for this, um, really looking at um, not not repatriation under NAGPRA, but, mm. but, re, but voluntary repatriation is what they're talking about. And so they've they've been sort of pushing this new project that really just came out this last year to start looking at um, doing that. And then just the movements, the decolonization movements and the people that are looking at returning things to indigenous communities that have been, you know, gained within colonial contexts or, or other contexts that are a little, you know, not very nice or friendly and so mm. it really is the shift i think uh, of um the approach of museums to be more inclusive um which Absolutely. is you know, positive and and good yeah that's i really like the word you use there angela inclusive you know, where, mm -hmm. you know, the museums are now also, you know, welcoming indigenous communities, but also those who are non-indigenous. Yeah, as you said, uh, you know, there that they need to understand uh, what these artifacts are and how they came to be in the museum. So it's mm -hmm. actually, you know, these groups of people, they need to learn from each other. Yeah. Right, because a lot of these indigenous communities, uh, even those that I work with Angela, most of the time they always tell me, Oh, we didn't know that these artifacts actually left our shores. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was working in England and I was, uh, you know, interviewing some of our uh, fellow Fijians that are living there, you know, even now there are what three generations of Fijians uh, who are living over there in, in, uh, in England. And uh, one of the discussions that came was when we were talking about repatriation. You know, they were saying to me, so if you're going to take, you know, all these artifacts away to Fiji, what about our, you know, new generations of Fijians that are now, you know, born here? You know, what what will they access? So it's kind of like um, uh, redefining the whole process of repatriation. Yeah. And I think that, you know, the, you know, we're, we look at, so I'm, I'm in a working group that's looking at Indigenous uh, Collections Care Guidelines. And, you know, it really is this idea of co-stewardship and what does the community need or what does the community want? The community having more voice in what that stewardship looks like, whether things stay or whether they go, how things should be cared for, 
um, you know, if there's certain ceremonies that need to be done, you know, how does that happen? When does that happen? So really allowing that, that cultural, the, the cultural context of those items and the spiritual needs of those items to be, uh, to come into that space, that museum space and, and be really awakened, right? Awakened and, and become living, living things again. Um, absolutely. Yeah, no, yeah. that's absolutely right. It's really great to see yeah, the different um, examples uh, from around the world, especially in the case of uh, uh, New Zealand, um, Aotearoa, uh, they really have taken uh, a huge, um, what do you call, uh, they've taken the responsibility yeah, to mm -hmm. make sure that the artifacts are, or the ancestral remains are brought back safely and applying the cultural etiquette uh, and ceremonies to it. You know, it was very moving uh, when I was in um, Germany um, you know, two years ago, well, 2022. Wow, time has moved so fast. <laughs> um, in November, in which um, Dr. Tehere Keke uh, Herwini, um, you know, facilitated uh, the uh, Maori ceremony. And it was so moving, uh, really moving. And even our colleagues in Germany, uh, learn so much, you know. So I think that uh, brought up the point you mentioned because sometimes, you know, we have to think of the non-Indigenous because they also need to learn and understand why we do things, you know, in certain ways. So there were so many questions uh, from our fellow uh, Germans that day, uh, Angela, uh, after Dr. Tehere Kiki conducted the ceremony. Mm. Yeah, Very it was good. really, I'm, really I'm beautiful. Yeah, I think it's important to, I mean, you know, it's to know where these things are too. I mean, I remember I was in Copenhagen on my way um, to Greenland and I stopped and went to the museum there. And, you know, I'm, I always go to see, okay, what do they have? What do they have from Hawaii, you know? And, and I, you know, went to the Oceania exhibit and, and saw things, that they had from Hawaii and they were, they were from voyages I had never heard of before. And so you, you know, you always hear about cook, you always sort of hear about the standard sort of, um, you know, groups that were coming through, but there were a lot of voyages in the Pacific that you, you just don't know about. And I was really surprised at the collections that they had there and the attribution of them to these voyages that I had never heard of before at all wow that is amazing <clears throat> you know you you correctly said that yeah, you know a lot of us are, are so fascinated or more uh know about captain cook yeah mm -hmm. and it seems now his voyage to the pacific is that kind of used as a kind of a, a um point of reference yeah so when people say is it pre-cook or post you know? mm -hmm. um but you rightly said that there are so many other voyages Wow. Yeah. So it yeah, would be nice, amazing. I think, to have some way to document all the, you know, collections that are in museums all over the world. So you you know where things are. And and um and I think, you know, given the way the internet works now and just digital, you know, the ability to create digital things makes it a, a easier process than probably before where you had um, you know, I've, I've had, uh, I know of a lady who was in Europe and she'd go to museums and she would write in a notebook, the things that she saw. And, and I think she came back and shared that notebook with people, but you know, that's a very limited sort of reference for folks. Right. And, and you kind of know, and. Absolutely. You know. Yeah. That, that needs, and now we can use technology mm -hmm. and in this case, social media as well, you know, to, you know, gather support and and bring people to share uh, the different collections, you know, all, all around the world. Uh, during my PhD uh, research, uh, Angela, one of the outputs that I included in my thesis was for, uh, in the case of Fiji, because I was focusing on Fiji, was for uh, uh, inventory, you know, for museums um, all around the world, um, you know, when it comes to Fijian collection, if they can allow the Fijian collection, you know, to be more visible, maybe, you know, or more um, maybe the staff to perhaps give time 
for them to just do inventory of region collection for one year or two years. Uh, you know, and then we just make the rounds, you know, after Fiji, like how they did it in New Zealand, they did it alphabetically, you know, and it was amazing how within three years, we were able to go through um, Pacific collections from Cook Islands to Wallis and Futuna. You know, so museums can think of those kind of ways eh, to get people right. involved. Mm. Wow. So for those of you who are watching Bula, Bula Vinaka, Aloha, Auntie Tether says a few from Hawaii, um, watching from Oahu, Don Bula Vinaka mei laie, Bula Vinaka mei Tahiti, Epeli, Tau Epeli Nrao. For those of you who are watching, if you have any particular questions, you know, for me and Angela, because I know our field of work is very unique, is very different. Um, some of you may... Uh, uh, were wanting to find out questions of what we do in museums, uh, please ask. Yeah, type the questions here on the chat. Um, any questions that you want to know about museums? I think that's uh, you know really really interesting. So don't be shy. I know Fijians they always ask questions um, around the cover bowl. Unfortunately, we don't have cover right now, <laughs> but. Uh... <laughs> Uh, whatever you are doing, please, yeah, feel free to ask any questions um, to me and Angela, you know, in terms of the work that we do. Uh, Angela is a curator, um, so she has defined the, the role that she played earlier on. And for me, when I was working in Fiji, I worked also in, in archaeology, uh, worked in archaeology. And then I went to New Zealand where I started working in collections. So it seems like our, our work, Angela, is very similar. Yeah, so archaeology mm -hmm. into collections. Um, I do a little bit of exhibitions as well. And now um, now I'm into teaching. Yeah, so really kind of, uh, you know, teaching a lot of what we do in museums. Now, Angela, you mentioned that you were also um, helping to teach as well for the last five years. Um, yeah, would you like just to share how, you know, like most people may say, if you're a curator, that's all you do. Yeah, you go in the morning, yeah. you come back in the evening, and that's all you do, you know, most of the day. Um, but it's interesting, you know, to hear that our work can be diverse. You know, we mm -hmm. can wear different hats. Uh, how did that happen to you, Angela, for you to now start teaching some of those museum courses? Yeah, I had um, uh, folks approach me from Central Washington University about teaching uh, the museum curation and management class. So it's really a collections management class. Um, they asked me, um, really given my history of working in museums, working with collections, working with indigenous communities to um, sort of bring the that aspect of the importance of collections and, and how do you work within that framework. So almost moving away from that, um, always have your gloves on, you can't touch anything, you know what I mean, approach to really kind of being a little more open and understanding that the objects are important to communities. And, and um, so the class I teach um, is collections management. You know, we learn about cataloging and inventory and registration and you know, pests and cleaning, house clean cleaning. And, but we also talk about the importance of community um, and the relationship of community. Um, and, you know, we're talking indigenous communities, right? So whether, you know, if you have a collection of Chinese material, you're working with your Chinese community and, and, you know, so it's not, it's not just, you know, Native American or, or, um, um, you know, Pacific Islander, but but really the 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 source community. I mean, I think that's really a good term, the source community of your collections and working with them. And so we spend um, you know, we spend most of the class learning about your basic collection management and resources and laws. But then we spend sort of towards the end um, talking about the importance of of community and relationship to collections and how do you work with community and and um, value that that you should be working with community in in that work um, and so I've been doing it for five years I just finished my fifth year of teaching that class and I um, think it, it's been good and I, I think um, I feel like the students these days are a lot more open 
to those concepts um, than, you know, the older gen. I think with with NAGPRA, you hear a lot about um, um, some museums, you have to sort of wait for a certain generation of people to retire before that museum kind of becomes better built, you know, tends to build better relationships with, with their indigenous communities. And so I feel like the younger generation seems to already be much more ahead of the of the curve in terms of of understanding that relationship and being open to having that um, connection wow. and inclusion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, that that inclusion. Yeah, uh, being 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 to be inclusive is really really powerful. Um, and I think for museums or cultural centers or heritage centers that does that, um, you know, they kind of um, um, yeah, it's it's a positive thing, yeah, where mm -hmm. you are including everyone, particularly our indigenous communities, to even access uh, the the collections as well. So you mentioned NECPRA again, and I remember when you were saying it earlier on, I was going to share it with our listeners, um, the importance of that particular act. Eh? It was enacted in 1990. So mm -hmm. for those of you who have just joined us, the NECPRA, which is the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, um, it gives the power for museums or any collections in the United States to return any ancestral remains that they have, or even funerary objects there, yeah, Angela? Mm. Yep, sacred objects and objects of cultural patrimony. Right. Very so, specifically defined, yep. Wow, and they have to be returned to the source community, right? Yes. Okay. They meet and those definitions, yeah. Wow. And were they given like a specific period of time, like five to 10 years? Yeah, they were happen? given up to, they were given three years to provide, uh, in 1990, they were given three years to provide summaries to communities about the collections that they have so that you could begin consultation to identify um, non, uh, to identify, um, unassociated funerary objects, sacred objects, and objects of cultural patrimony. And then they were given five years to provide an inventory of human remains and associated funerary objects that you had in, in your collections. Um, just recently on January, December 13th, the, a new, um, revised regulations for NAGPRA were published and they went into effect on January 14th, I believe. And um, so it's, it's the approach is very different now and there's a stronger timeline to um, um, get things returned and be responsive. Um, they've removed the culturally unidentifiable, which um, I think people felt were, were allowing museums to say, well, we don't know who this belongs to, so we're, we don't need to do anything. And it's added a duty of care requirement um, where you need to give voice to tribal communities on how you care for, access, and exhibit um, NAGPRA items. And so that's kind of a, a new um, aspect of the law. It's, 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 it's been confusing to some folks because, mm -hmm. um, you know, how do you identify sacred objects, objects of cultural patrimony without consultation? Um, so it's, you know, people aren't really quite sure the order of how to process that. See. But, wow. But it's just really, to me, you know, when I was, you know, writing about my work back, you know, uh, 10 years ago, you know, I was using the NEPRA as a really wonderful example of how countries can, you know, create strong laws and empower it, you know, and just get a lot of these institutions to act and do something about it. Yeah. Um, that's something that kind of frustrates me when I'm working in the Pacific, in which a lot of our legislations are very ancient, you know, very colonial, very archaic. And that's something I've been really wanting to encourage a lot of our legislations to be reviewed so that it becomes current, but then using the NACPRA as kind of like a, an example, you know, to look at, you know, to say, okay, we can create something similar 
but it has to be something that is focused for each individual countries, but the Pacific to, you know, learn from, um, you know, from the example of the United States. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think another Stop. important um, law that's recently passed is the STOP Act, the Safe uh, Guarding Tribal Heritage, I don't remember what the, what it stands for, but it really is looking at, at um, a process that um, prevents the export of items out of out of the United States. So I think that there was, you know, there was a lot of issues with um, auctions in Europe that were happening, materials being exported out of the United States and then being auctioned in Europe to sort of avoid any, you know, potential stoppage um, with, you know, using NAGPRA as a stoppage. And so I think that would be a good thing to look at too for for countries in the Pacific as well to, you know, just even stop items leaving the country to begin with. Yes, that's so true. You know, and yeah. it's so painful when you go online, you know, and you see all these, um, you know, um, uh, websites, you know, that are selling, you know, a mm -hmm. lot of our artifacts and not, not only just treasures, you know, special artifacts, but also ancestral remains. I was mm -hmm. contacted uh, two years ago by uh, one of our colleagues from Australia, uh, Dr. Michael um, Pickering, and he reached out to me and said that he is trying to stop uh, the sale of uh, a, um, a cranium um, that had Fiji on it from mm -hmm. Australia, and there was a buyer you know, somewhere in Europe. And, you know, he was so mad about it. And he reached out to me about the, this potential sale. Um, but I think uh, we followed up and then the sale didn't uh, take place. I have a feeling that he must have intervened. Um, and so this is a really good, um, you know, um, sharing, yeah, that we need to alert our, you know, community just so they know that no one just popped in, you know, to buy stuff from you. Um, for example, in Tonga, they were buying, um, what do you call it? They were buying uh, stone tools, um, mm -hmm. edges for five paanga. And eventually they will be, you know, auctioned or sold online for maybe 50 US or 100 US. Um, are those kind of things you have seen as well in your line of work, Angela? Um, I see a lot of things um, for sale. Um Um, mm. I think, you know, in terms of from the, from where I work here, there's a lot of collectors who were excavating and doing um, archaeology and those things are for sale. I know the American, what is it? The AI, American Association, <laughs> I'm not really good with my uh, acronyms. The, ac the acronyms, yeah. Um, the AIA, they have a, um, they watch auctions in the United States and have auction alerts to let people know when things are coming up for auction. And so um, you see a lot of archeological um, material being sold like projectile points and things like that. Um, but, you know, just even recently, I saw some Hawaiian artifacts that are in a sale that's actually next week. Um, so an old uh, Ni'ihau um, um, gourd, um, that, you know, that has designs on it. So just that, that um, practice that really is one of those lost, I think some folks are doing it again, but, you know, it was considered a really lost art, art form in Hawaii, kind of like the kapa was for a long time. Um, and I think that was in a, probably in a, a collection that someone's had for probably a few decades, wow. but wow. it's, so it's there's a lot out there. Absolutely. Um, and I remember too, Angela, when I was in New Zealand, the team um, at Te Papa, mm -hmm. and I think Auckland Museum as well, they often go on these auction sites and if they see some really important um, treasures or taonga, they, they purchase them yeah? mm -hmm. uh, just so, you know, they can be able to, to, to bring it home. So it has its plus side, but it also has the other side, yeah, right, of right. Uh, the whole thing yeah. where things can be illegally taken away. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I think that's a hard, you know, that's a hard one where, you know, people, you, you don't want to buy buy it and kind of 
fuel the market, right? But you also um, want it to come home. And what do you, you know, what do you, what are you going to do about that? Um, it's a, it's a hard, it's a hard one. I know there's tribes in the U.S. that have had advocates that will purchase things from auctions and return them to tribes, especially when the tribes don't have the finances to be able to do that for themselves. Um, um, but then you also hear stories about um, people who, you know, auction houses that know that there is tribal interest and they will be bidding on something and then they end up putting sort of a mole in the auction mm -hmm. who kind of pushes the prices up. Um, wow. So, you know, you hear about that too, which is not, would be nice if they would sell it within their estimated estimated range right price range yeah but. and oh, i remember to um uh, angela uh, we had a high profile case in the case of fiji so for fiji um uh, audience i'm not sure how many of you remember this uh this was in the late 90s angela uh, we had the last or maybe i could say the only remaining ivory goddess um, which is called the Rendini Waymaro. Um, and it, um, it, it, they came in a pair. So there's a male version of the, so there's a goddess and there's the other, the other male version. And they are carved from whale's tooth. And um, they belong to one of the tribes uh, up in the Naitasi province. And uh, the late um, Aubrey Parks, who, who he just got his PhD, Dr. Aubrey Parks, he's a, uh, um, and he passed away uh, soon after, and he wrote a really good paper about uh, this uh, particular ivory goddess. And uh, because of that paper, um, and Adila read it, read about it, and made his way. Everyone thinks it's actually in Europe, uh, but we were not sure actually as to which country in Europe, but ended up in this particular village. Um, and to cut the long story short, ended up um, gaining the trust of the family that was looking after this particular ivory goddess and took the mm. treasure out of Fiji. And by the time the Fiji Museum was informed, it was already too late because the art dealer who pretended to be a tourist um, has flown over to New Zealand. And so when the report came to us, we contacted the uh, um, Auckland and apparently he when they tracked him through the Auckland police uh, over there they found out that he was staying in an apartment which was fascinating that it was actually located near the Auckland Museum hmm. so so he must must have known what he was doing maybe something else he's doing over there but by the time they tried to get to him he was already flown over to Sydney in Australia and then when the Sydney police you know it was just Fascinating to see how this network uh, happened. Um, the person has already gone and uh, left Australia. So right now, as we speak, uh, we are, you know, there's a few of us who are checking the red list uh, under ICOM mm -hmm. to see if, uh, you know, anyone can be able to identify this very beautiful um, ivory goddess, mm -hmm. the only one for Fiji. Um, so we hope that, you know, through this podcast and through many other means, maybe we could, uh, even in my case, to actually write a paper as well in response to what happened to mm -hmm. see whether we could spread the word out there. Yeah. And hopefully we can be able to get it back home. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So to our listeners, our, our dear Fijian listeners, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar uh, with Rendine Waimaro, but if you do, uh, you can um, uh, write a comment. Uh, on the chat uh, as well and um, yeah it's just fascinating we have so many stories uh, to share between me and Angela uh, but today we're just kind of sharing you know some of the aspects of our work yeah, yeah. Um, so for you Angela do you enjoy uh, doing the work you do as curator at the Wanapum Heritage Centre? Yeah. I really do enjoy it I feel like that's my calling um, you know I'd, I'd rather of course be in Hawaii doing it there um but i'm i'm happy to um support another community in in that work 
Um, I guess what I'd be interested in, and you talked about the Fiji Museum, you know, hearing about the goddess and trying to stop it. And I'm really curious about what you think about museums as places to, to um, protect, I think, some of these community treasures, um, you know, Maybe, you know, I know that's such a hard thing because museums, you know, people think of them as colonial structures and, yeah. and, uh, but I also, you know, wonder about if that, you know, if that family had felt like it was okay to keep, mm -hmm. you know, and maybe part of that is that idea of, of having that co-stewardship and really having those voices included where people feel like, I can safely ask you to hold this for me and you'll take care of it the way I ask you to take care of it. And I can always come and take it if I need to use it or, you know what I mean? And, and yes. then they would be a little more open to that place being a place to hold, hold things safely. Um, yes. Actually, you, you raised a really good point because I was listening to uh, one of their staff at the Fiji Museum. Uh, two weeks ago, there was a celebration of uh, the Internet, uh, Indigenous um, Mother Language Day, you know, when which, you know, we celebrate our languages. And uh, the manager of technical services, Ratuchone Balenevalu, uh, Balavu, he was interviewed and he was sharing that particular point. And I was so happy to hear that. Uh, so he was uh, speaking in the Fijian language. He was interviewed by the um, Fijian television program in Fiji and uh, sharing that um, the Fiji Museum is a place where they can be kept, you know, certain treasures that, you know, may be unsafe in their own home, in the villages, they can be able to bring it in. So thank you for um, highlighting that because I just heard it two weeks ago. So I'm so happy. So to the staff of the Fiji Museum, uh, thank you so much for, you know, taking that step. I know it's going to be, you know, a lot of work to be done, but they announced it and they said that they are going to do it. I have a feeling they were doing it a few years ago as well, but they were sharing that this is a service that we offer. Wow. Yeah. See, so museums can play that role too, right? Yeah. I think it, you know, it might take some time to build that trust, right? Yes. Between communities and museums Absolutely. For, for that to happen. But yes. Mm. And, you know, with the, when that particular goddess, um, you know, left Fiji, I think we were using that as an example, you know, to say, if we are, if you're not going to take advantage of the service that we have, then that's going to happen. You know, mm -hmm. so it was a wake up call, um, Angela, and I think it's it's a good thing that we can be able to talk about it openly like this, and also to our listeners, you know, uh, this is something you can talk about in your own family if there are certain um, treasures like whale's tooth or mats or tapa that you feel that uh, needs to be kept in the museum, like what Angela has just suggested. Please um, take advantage of that. Um, and I totally agree with that, Angela. Thank you. Um, that's a really a good way yeah, to relook at the role of museums. They're not there to take stuff from you. They are there to be custodians. Yeah, they're going to look after it. Mm. I think, I think you know, in the United States, there really is a big movement for tribes to build their own cultural centers and museums to, to hold those things or to bring things back to the community and have a safe place for them. And, and so I think ATOM, you know, you'll be going to ATOM in California, um, is a really, has been really um, helpful and supportive for tribes to um, really kind of think about that and, and help provide resources for them to, you know, follow through with that. And, and I know that um, IMLS Institute of Museum and Library Services has been really good about funding tribes um, for different projects, you know, cultural projects, language projects, but also um, developing tribal museums. Mm -hmm. So it's been a really good wow. programs there to help help tribes sort of create their own facilities to care for their own things in yes. a safe way. Oh, that is so empowering, yeah? Mm -hmm. When you hear the word tribal museums, yeah? Um, so in the case of Fiji, for those of my Fijian friends, 
maybe we can start thinking about having provincial museums. You know, we have 14 provinces in Fiji, Angela, uh, and we have the island of Rotuma. So can you imagine, you know, having a museum in each of these provinces? Yeah, Joey, uh, we should plan to do one in Kandab and one in Bua. Uh, she's from the province of Bua, uh, to have a museum or a cultural center uh, in those places. Wow. I know in Hawaii, I've been, you know, wanting to deal with the issue of archaeological collections in Hawaii. And we've talked about island repositories for a long time, having and keeping those collections on that island that they came from. Um, but it's a, you know, it's a long process too. And you know how expensive Hawaii is. So just to be able to fund a facility and have it and who's going to work on it and but it's, you know, a dream, right? It's a vision. Yes. So at least, you know, you're thinking about it. It's mm -hmm. been talked about and, uh, you know, you never know. Um, you know, sometimes those uh, ideas are like seeds, you know, mm -hmm. like seedlings, you know, uh, when it falls in the on the right type of soil, you never know. Yeah. yeah. It's going to germinate. Maybe not in our generation. Maybe in the next generation, they might bring it to fruition. What do you think? Okay. Yeah. So for me, that's one of my dreams as well, Angela. Uh, we know that I have a farm uh, oh, in uh, Lamosis. I've been sharing some photos. And one of my dreams is to build a museum uh, or a cultural center in the farm that uh, we are um, expanding over there. And uh, the place where my husband is from in the province of Lamosis, they have so much rich history. And uh, I feel that you know, the students or the young ones from that province, they don't have to hike or take a bus for the whole day just to come to the Fiji Museum in Suva. Mm -hmm. uh, but if they can have a museum close to where they live, you know, and they can come as a school and do research in that cultural center or that museum. So, yeah, so that's one of my um, retirement program that I wanted to do. <laughs> that I can be able to, you know, pass it on to the rest of the community. So, Angela, um, any last words you want to share uh, to our listeners in terms of maybe, you know, advice for um, visiting museums or encouraging, you know, our families, you know, just to go to these museums to um, for education purposes or even our Indigenous communities to go and access some of this information that is related to them? I, I guess for me, um... The, I, the advice would be to contact them. I mean, if you think they have things that you, that are part from your community, contact them and say, Hey, I want to come and I want to see what you have and, and do that. I, I feel like some people feel like they're, they can't do that. Right. They're not supposed to go behind the scenes. They can only go into the exhibits, but I think uh, people would be surprised at how many doors would be open just by making that contact and saying, hey, I'm going to be there and I'd like to come and see what you have from, you know, such and such a place or such and such a um, community. And and uh, I think you would be pleasantly surprised that they might open the door and let you come in. Mm, there you go. Eh? That's a really good um you know, way to encourage our, our listeners and our families, uh, mm -hmm. you know, who are listening in, as Angela said, you know, reach out to these museums, wherever you're logging in from, uh, there will be museums next, you know, next to your home, close in your township, um, and just go on their website. Many of these museums have websites. Just type it in, you know, type in your island, type in Fiji maybe as a starter, if you're from Fiji or if you're from Samoa, type in Samoa and just see what pops up. Like you know, a, and yeah. it'll be just amazing. It'll be, you will be amazed, you know, and curators, I would say, Angela, most of the time, they're always happy to get visitors, you mm. know, if they, yeah. if you pop in, just make an appointment and say, I'll be there next week on Friday at 10 o'clock, they will be there waiting for you, you know, so yeah. you just take that one step forward and go for it. Yeah. So, Angela, thank you so much for yeah, joining you. me today on this very beautiful uh Friday evening um, and we are here also celebrating International Women's Day and I'm so grateful that you could be able to join me and just you know talk story about museums talk story about archaeology and uh, just the contribution that you have also uh, contributed to Hawaii and also in the U.S. 
Um, we just want to say thank you to you, Angela, for the amazing work you do in your own community uh, as well. And, uh, you know, you have inspired so many, you know, who are coming up the ranks um, and um, the same with me as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So all the very best, uh, Angela. And I look forward to visit you in Washington sometime. Yeah. Uh, and if you come down this part of the world, just let me know and we can have lunch or dinner. Okay. Sounds good. Thank all you right. For Take morning. care. Thank you for all your work too. <laughs> You're most welcome. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Wow. So to our listeners, uh, we're so grateful and uh, honored to have uh, Angela uh, Nella uh, with us, uh, joining in from uh, the state of Washington. And uh, we decided to use this uh, International Women's Day just to uh, come and tell Noah, come and talk story and just share, um, you know, some of the um, experiences that we both have uh, in uh, working in museums and collections. And now I just realized that we have something in common, which is archaeology. Uh, archaeology is uh, yeah, I just love, love, love old things. And I know, uh, Angela, a lot of my friends always tell me, uh, you know, how did you end up in that field? Um, I have to say that my parents, uh, my mom and dad were very good storytellers, uh, especially mm -hmm. my mom. So all the stories of how they grew up on the island of Kandavu um, inspired me, you know, my imagination to think back to when they were growing up back then in the early 1900s. So my dad was born in 1937 and my mom was born in 1938. So it was still during the colonial period, yeah? Um, but out of the siblings, I was born in Suva. So I missed out on the fun and everything that was happening on the island. But I was very fortunate that my parents took us back to the island every other year when I was growing up in Suva. So that storytelling allowed me to appreciate you know, old things, you know, the story of our ancient times, you know, all those myths and legends and even some of my mom's, you know, own experiences of going fishing uh, or going over to the forest to collect firewood. Um, and those experiences added to my love for what I do now. So again, I just wanted to encourage a lot of our parents out there, you know, if you are doing storytelling to your children and your grandchildren, I know Angela, you're going to be a grandma soon. You know, I'm sure you have so many stories to share to them. You never know you are, you know, uh, sharing that seed. You know, you're planting that seed on your children and grandchildren, and that will impact on them, you know, years and years in the future. Eh? So that is something I just wanted to end our Talano today to encourage a lot of sharing within the home and then empower our children before they go out to the school. And then of course, encouraging many of our mothers and sisters here to go to the museums, go to your local museums and use that as an extension of the school that your children attend. All right, so thank you so much, uh, Angela. I'll say goodbye for now and to our listeners, Kakiteano, thank you and good night. Bye. Aloha. Aloha.